الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا الله صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل جزاء الإحسان إلا الإحسان صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi when he was training his companions and his students and in some of the narrations and some of the books actually some scholars have dedicated their time to actually recording down the names of the students of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam alayhi salam and they recorded down the names of 4,000 individual. Their names are written down. One of the ulama or the scholars, may Allah bless his soul, he started writing the encyclopedia of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. And then he died. May Allah bless his soul. He died. His sons continued. And they managed to dedicate some volumes for the names of the children of the students of Imam al Sadiq, and they wrote down their names. And those are considered as trustworthy thuqat. So, individuals who actually not just narrate a hadith and you discredit them, these are the trustworthy individuals who can trust their hadith from Imam al Sadiq, which is a huge number. But Imam السلام, didn't just teach, he was building. Before I stated that the madhab of Ahlul Bayt السلام, some writers say that this is the madhab of Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, which is established by Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq. Again, we want to clarify that the madhab is not established by Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq. The madhab is established by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He is the one who established the madhab. He is the one who laid the foundation of the madhab. Imam al-Sadiq salam, all he did is he completed the and perfected the building of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. He had an opportunity where he could perfect it. You know, sometimes when you build a building, if you leave it standing for too long, you have to do some maintenance. So Imam al-Sadiq salam, had that opportunity to do the maintenance work. He had that opportunity. So in the process, he started transforming that knowledge to the people, to the public. But when he was transforming this, he was not just teaching knowledge to them and just giving building scholars. No, he was building individuals. And so one of the hadith that is mentioned by many lecturers and scholars that many of you have heard is the hadith of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam that states kunu zaynan lana wa la takunu shaynan alayna be a source of pride for us and do not be a source of embarrassment for us so that when people look at you they say, this is how Ja'far ibn Muhammad disciplined his Shia or his companions. Now, we want to spend some time on this hadith a little bit. We hear it a lot, but let's look a little bit into the meaning of this hadith. 
What does it really entail? Before I get into the meaning of this hadith, I just want to mention an introduction, and that is there is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam that says, Ana wa Ali abawa hadhihi al Ali and I are the parents of this nation, are the fathers of this nation, sorry. Ali and I are the fathers of this nation. Now, one of the duties of a father is to care for his children, to take care of their children, of his children, make sure to guide them what is right and what is wrong. That is a duty of the father. For example, if you read Risalat al huquq the Charter of Rights by Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, he says one of the rights of the son or the child over his father, the child also has rights. One of them, for example, is that he names him a good name. That is a right. So a caring father has to even think of this. The name should be a good name. It starts from that, that point, even before he is born. Or when he is born, the name that is given to him, that is important. You know, my father says that, you know, we're talking about 50 years ago or so. In Baghdad, there was a juice maker, somebody who used to sell juices. And he says this had the best juice in, in the city of Baghdad. You know, this we're talking about many, many years ago. And it said, Mashrubat al Haj Zubala, which is the juices of Haji. Zubala, which means garbage. Haji garbage. And that his name was Zubala. Now of all the names, the parents chose this name for whatever reason. Yani, I don't know, maybe the father had lots of children and finally he's having one more. He's like, you know, this is... Anyways, so sometimes you have unfortunately these mentalities. And even here, you know, why go far? Why go 50 years ago? Even here, you have children who are born and instead of naming them Mahmoud, Ahmed, Ali, we have so many Imams, mashallah, and so many titles of the Imams, alayhim salam. Khayrul Asma'i Ma'ubbida Wa Hummid. The best of the names is the one that starts with Abd of so and so, Abdullah, Abdul Hamid, Abdul Majid, and so and so. Or Hummid, the names of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the names of Ahl al-Bayt, it's Mustahab. You find people naming some strange names. I don't know where they come from. In the dream they see them or whatever. Anyways. So this is the beginning. A caring father starts like taking care of these things. And Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam were also these caring parents, these caring fathers of the nation of the Ummah. And so a father wants his children to be in the perfect state. They teach them what is right and what is wrong. Do this and don't do that. Not only in matters, for example, of religion. No, you find them going further. For example, a father would teach his sons or his daughters, his children, don't eat, for example, junk food. Eat healthy food. It's good for you. A caring father would do this. You find our imams doing the same. Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, for example. Imam al-Sadiq, there is a book written called Tibbul Imam al-Sadiq, the medicine of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, where he describes many things, the benefits of several fruits, for example, what benefits they have. In one hadith in that book, he states, do not take medicine if your body can withstand the pain. If the pain is very minor, that your body can withstand it, don't take medication for it, he says. Bear with it until it goes away. If not, then yes, go ahead. Now, 1400 years later, we have doctors and medical individuals who say, yes, every medication today, take a look at every medication you, you go by. They'll tell you, the pharmacist will come and say, you know, there are some what? Side effects. There are some side effects to this medication. Huh? Yani if, it's, if you can avoid it, yes, better. Better to avoid it. But if you can't, you need to take it. 
Now, of course, this saying doesn't go very well with pharmaceutical industry. You know, they, they don't like this hadith. But nonetheless, it comes with some side effects. So if it's better to stay away from it, stay away from it. Imam al said it 1,400 years ago. Medication, yes, if it's necessary, take it. But if you can, don't take it. Avoid it. You know, there will be side effects. So a caring father, a caring individual, that's how he looks after the children. And that's how Imam, our Imams السلام, were, including Imam al-Sadiq When he comes to this hadith, he says, Kunu zaynan lana wa la takunu shaynan alayna. Be a source of pride for us and do not be a source of shame and embarrassment. A father sometimes when his son does something wrong, his son, for example, a child goes, takes a rock and throws it at the neighbor's windows and breaks it. So the parent will come, knock at the door and say, you know, your son just broke my window. The father will say, I'm very sorry about that. Now, why is the father apologizing? He didn't do anything. The son did. It's not his fault. It's not the father's fault. But the father takes the pain. He says, you know what? I was the one that should have disciplined my son better. This embarrassment is reflected on me. And hence, the father will say, I apologize. You know, sometimes the father will say, you know what? Khalas, he broke it. He's a child. Go and he'll give you a punch in the face probably too. And, and, and that's in some parts of the world, mashallah, that's what they do as well. So, but a caring father, a caring individual, somebody who's responsible, that's what we do. He'll apologize, you know, we'll repair whatever it is. And Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam say the same thing. They say, you know what? You people are like our children. We want you to be a source of our pride, not a source of our embarrassment. So this hadith, from one angle, it shows us how caring Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam are with their nation, with their Shia, with their followers. The second point is it shows us that Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam were not just responsible for teaching us fiqh and usul and the ahkam of religion. No, they were responsible for raising individuals who can establish a successful society. Individuals who are perfect. They expected somebody who is in the state of perfection. One day Imam al-Sadiq was walking with one of his companions. This companion had a servant. The servant went missing. He looked, he found his servant is gone, he's missing. So he kept looking for him and then the servant came back after a little while. This companion of Imam got upset that how can you go without telling me you just disappear in the middle of nowhere. He called him a bad name. Reflecting his mother, the servant's mother. He used a, a bad language. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, it is said that he became so angry. He told this man, he said, I thought you had some taqwa, you had some piety. And that's why I'm walking with you. But apparently you don't really respect the meaning of piety and taqwa. The piety has not really gone into your heart or is not stemming from your heart. It is just on your limbs. It's not coming from the heart. Because if it is coming from the heart, you would not have said a word like this. How can you use such a language against his mother? The man then started becoming defensive. He said, Ya ibn Rasulillah, but he, his mother is not a Muslim even. She's not a Muslim. She's from, you know, a different part of the world. They're not Muslims. And their, their wedding and their marriage is not accepted. That weren't, so everything is wrong. He said, don't you know that every nation has its own form of nikah? Every religion has its own form of nikah, of marriage. 
and Islam approves of these marriages. When the Mushrikeen of Mecca became Muslims, the Prophet didn't bring everybody back, and especially the women, tell them, come, come, I have some good news for you. We're going to have a second wedding for you here, celebration, you know, mashallah. No, the marriage was approved. The marriage was approved. And even in Jahiliya, people used to get married. They had a form of a marriage. And there were those who would not get married. And they were known. They were known in Jahiliya. Those who would not. And even in Jahiliya, in, in Quraysh, this was considered a bad act. And hence there were some women who were known as honest, honorable ladies, like Khadija, salamullahi alayha. Khadija was known for her nobility and honesty and greatness. And there were some people, some women, whose names we will not mention because it's sensitive sometimes. But they were known for being who they were. So this was known. He said, don't you know that every nation, every religion, every society has a form of marriage and Islam approves of it? What right is given to you to use such language? So from today onwards, you will not walk with me anymore. Finish. Khalas. Go. And the narrator says, I never saw this man with Imam al-Sadiq again. Imam al-Sadiq used to discipline his companions, discipline them. Make sure that they grow up, grow up not physically, grow up spiritually to become leaders in the society to become citizens of the society. Now, if we ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, a question. Now, this companion of the Imam used one foul language and the Imam told him, go away. Now, if we are with Imam al-Sadiq, alayhi salam, you know, would he still stay with us? Or he would, you know, many years ago, he says, get out of my face. You know, sometimes when we read these ahadith and we hear these stories, they really make us stop and reflect a little bit as opposed to just hearing them, you know. These are all lessons for us. When Imam talks in such language, harsh language, with a person who he always was walking with the Imam, it means Imam has certain criteria for people who associate with him. And we have to ask ourselves, do we have these criteria? Do we qualify? One day, Abu Hamza Thumali, may Allah bless him. Abu Hamza, he says, I came to Baqi'ah for ziyarah. And I was riding my donkey on the Baqi'ah, inside the Baqi'ah. He said, then I had a messenger come to me and he says, Ya Abu Hamza, ajib mawlak. Oh, Abu Hamza, go and attend to your master. He's calling you. So Abu Hamza said, I headed towards Imam al-Sadiq, I went to his house. He says, I came to him. I said, Assalamu alayka, ya ibn Rasulillah. Imam al-Sadiq, also told him, Ya Abu Hamza, wa alayka as-salam. Come, Ya Abu Hamza. Inni la astarihu li ru'yatik. I feel comfortable when I see you. Ya Abu Hamza. Now it is no wonder that Allah blessed Abu Hamza in learning dua Abu Hamza by Imam al-Sajjad If it's a person, if he is a man whom Imam al-Sadiq tells him, I feel comfortable when I see you. So that is the criteria, it makes us really want to learn more about Abu Hamza Thumali. You know, what was this man like? That it made him achieve a status so high that Imam al-Sadiq would tell him that I feel comfortable when I see you. So, but we see that Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is trying to raise a group of individuals who not just know fiqh and usul and religion, but rather they are citizens of a society. They are builders of a society. They are individuals who are complete. 
And then there is a reason for this. There is a reason. He says, so when people look at you, they say, Ja'far ibn Muhammad knew how to discipline his companions. So when people look at the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, they say, yes, these people are the Shia of Ja'far ibn Muhammad. These are the Shia. If that is their Imam, then yes, definitely, they'll have his, this individuals. A man says, one day I lost... Before, when they used to go to Hajj, even today, they have a belt in which they put their money sometimes. So before, they had the same thing. They put, take a belt when they go to Hajj, and they put their money in the belt. So this man says, I went to Medina, and then I went to sleep in the masjid. In the masjid, I slept. I woke up. I started looking for my belt. I couldn't find it. I thought that it was stolen from me. Somebody stole my belt. So I woke up. I got up. I immediately left the masjid. The first person I saw, I thought he probably is the one. He's the thief. So I went and I caught him. I told him, give me back my belt. You stole my money. He said, he looked at me, he said, how much money did you have in the belt? He said, 1,000 dinar. He said, come with me. He took me home. He weighed 1,000 dinars for me and he said, here, take him. Go. He said, I took the money. I went back home. In the house, I saw my belt. Apparently, I had forgotten my belt at home. I thought I had it on me when I went to the masjid, but apparently I didn't have it on me. He says, so then I came out and I felt so embarrassed. I accused this man of robbing me. And then he gave me the money. So then I went back to his house. I knocked at his door. I said to him, take your money back. He said, no. Whatever money we give doesn't come back to us anymore. It's yours. He said, I left. And I was shocked. I asked people, I said, who is the owner of this house? He said, if that is the house of Ja'far, if this is Ja'far ibn Muhammad, then there's no surprise. This is what he does. Yani Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes he's telling us that money is not an issue. If somebody, if it's an amount that can solve a problem. Now, in this case, the amount was not a little amount. 1,000 dinars at the time was a lot of money. But if a person can avoid a dispute between mu'mineen. This man has come to Umrah and he's coming for the ziyarah of Rasulullah in Medina. If a dispute can be stopped by paying some money, do so. What is the importance and the significance of a few hundred dollars if some mu'mineen can peace be brought between them? In another hadith, we read from Al-Mufaddal ibn Amr, Mufaddal said, I saw two people fighting. So I told them, what is the matter? They said, you know, this person borrowed 400 dirhams from me and he's not returning it back from me, to me. He said, come home. He took 400 dirham and he paid it to him. He said, khalas, take 400. You're happy now? He said, yes, alhamdulillah, I'm happy. He said, you guys are clear now? Everything is good? Said, good. But they said, yeah, Mufaddal, he should pay me the money, not you. He said, this is not my money. He said, this is money that Imam al-Sadiq gave to me. And he told me, Ya Mufaddal, if you find two of our Shia fighting because of money, solve it with this money. Solve the problem. Don't let there be a dispute. Now, how many of us, unfortunately, have that attitude? 
have this akhlaq, have this manners. If it's an issue that can be solved because of money, we as a community should try to help and solve this issue. That's what Imam al-Sadiq wants. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, brothers and sisters, wanted to raise individuals who can really understand the meaning of kindness, ihsan. So he wanted to raise individuals who are muhsineen. And the ayah that we read today said, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Isn't the reward for kindness but kindness. And Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam told his companion Ali ibn Salim, he says, there is an ayah in the Quran that is not restricted. He said, which one, ibn Rasulullah? He says, this ayah, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ he said, this ayah applies for the mu'min and for the kafir. For somebody who is pious and somebody who is not pious. It applies for everybody. When a person does an act of kindness to you, you should return it back with a better act of kindness. And you should do an act of kindness to individuals not expecting anything back. That is called ihsan. When you do something to people, not expecting anything back in return. That is Ihsan. A companion was with Imam al-Sadiq one day, or one night. He said, I saw Imam al-Sadiq leaving from his house in the middle of the night, and he was carrying something, a bag on his back. He walked and something fell from the bag. So I ran. When I ran, he saw me. I ran to help him collect the, the things that fell from the bag. When I ran, he saw me. His name was Nawfali. He said, yes, I am, Ya Rasulullah. He said, help me gather this, this bread. Some of the bread fell. So he said, we collected the bread. We put it back in the bag. Then I went with, with the Imam. I saw him going by a group of people who were sleeping. He said, without waking them up, he would take these bread and he would put it on their clothes without waking them up one loaf two loaves three loaves until he finished everybody and then he went back i told him ibn rasulillah those individuals are of your shia he said no he said if they were of my shia i would not give them this much i would only give them a little bit of salt and that would be enough for them he said, but these are not of my Shia. So we're giving them more. This is the way he deals with people who don't follow him. That's the act of kindness. That is the definition of Ihsan. And Imam is teaching this Nawfali. This is what you should do with people. This is how you should deal with people. With this attitude. Even though they don't believe in me. Even though they're against me. In another hadith in, Alam, in Bihar, Alam al-Majlis, some people even used to talk bad about the Imam. They used to talk bad. One of the individuals, he used to use bad language against the Imam. Imam, what would he do? He would give the money to somebody else. He says, go give him the money as if you are giving it to him. Don't tell him this is from me. Tell him you're giving it to him. And so this man, he says, I would go give the money to this man, to this individual, and he would tell me, you are being kind to me while Ja'far ibn Muhammad doesn't even care about me. And he says, I would feel very upset. You know, I want to tell him this money actually comes from Ja'far ibn Muhammad. But the imam told me, instructed me, don't tell him. So then I would keep quiet. And he would continue giving me the money to go and give to this man. This is the act of kindness. And that's what Imam al-Sadiq wants of us brothers and sisters. We come to his majalis, insha'Allah, we celebrate his birthday, we celebrate his, his time, the times of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, the celebrations of Ahlul Bayt. We commemorate their musibah. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, what we have to really ask ourselves is this simple question, an honest question. Are we a source of pride for the Imam? Or billah, are we a source of embarrassment to the Imam? What are our actions like?
What are our attitudes like? Just now we saw a glimpse of some of the examples of how Imam al-Sadiq disciplines his people. He doesn't want them to use foul language. If they do, he will take them, go away from me. He wants them to be kind. He, they give without expecting anything back, even to people who don't agree with them, even to people who actually talk bad about them. He wants them to be individuals who are perfect in the society. So when people look at them, they say these are the followers of Ja'far ibn Muhammad. And then this will intrigue another question. When the individual sees this is mashallah, such a humble man, a mu'min, he's got good manners. Why? He'll be intrigued. So he'll come and ask, why do you do this? If you say, well, because Imam al-Sadiq told me to do this. He taught me to do this. My religion taught me. Then they'll ask, what is your religion? Who is Imam al-Sadiq? And that's what we want. I'll conclude with this. One day, one of the lecturers, may Allah bless his soul, he died. He said, I was in Hajj doing wudu. So a person came to me. This is many years ago when water was scarce. Water was not commonly available. Especially when you go to Arafat. Water was very scarce back in those days. He said, I was doing wudu. A person came to me. He said, I saw that the way you do wudu is different. What kind of wudu is this? You don't wash your feet. He said, this is the wudu of the madhab of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Al madhab al Ja'fari. He said, this man stopped. He said, what is that madhab? He said, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. He said, yes, yes, yes. I heard of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. I heard of him, yes. He said, no, no, Abu Ja'far al-Mansur is the one who killed Imam al-Sadiq. Not that man. We're talking about Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq. I started explaining to him who Imam al-Sadiq was. He said, the man then told me, I've never heard this before. And then he told me, you people have such great individuals and you don't tell us who they are. It is really your duty and your shortcomings for not telling us who these great individuals are. He said, you're right. I told him, you're right. It is our shortcomings. We have to go out telling people who Imam al-Sadiq is, who are Ahlul Bayt, because he says in the hadith, tell people about us, for if they know who we are, they will follow us. They don't know. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us insha'Allah among those who follow the path of Ahlul Bayt and those who Imam al-Sadiq would be pleased with and those who can carry the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam to the people so that people get to know who Ahlul Bayt are and then insha'Allah they will benefit and Imam al-Sadiq would be pleased with us. Let's raise our hands for the dua. Insha'Allah, by the barakah of the Imam, insha'Allah, Allah will accept our dua today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Amma yujibu al-mudtarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-suq أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 
يا الله يا الله يا الله إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله اكشف عنا سيئاتنا يا الله وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله إلهي بجعفر بن محمد اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله إلهي بجعفر بن محمد شافي وعافي جميع المرضى من المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم ألبسهم لباس العافية واقض حوائجهم جميعا يا الله إلهي بجعفر بن محمد اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم بجعفر بن محمد اكشف هذه الغمة عن هذه الأمة بتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان اللهم اجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراح اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه إلهي بجعفر بن محمد اجعلنا من شيعة جعفر بن محمد يا الله وارزقنا زيارته في الدنيا عاجلا وشفاعته آجلا اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغمة عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح أموات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات الله صل على محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم الضالين سبحانه أحسنتم جزيلا